Okay, it's five o'clock. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Mm -hmm. Pursuant to Government Appeal, March 29, 2023, revised order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, GL Chapter 38, Section 18. Meetings of the Berkshire Hills Regional School District School Committee will be conducted both in person and remote from March 31st, 2025. Agenda items listed are those reasonably anticipated by the chair, and all, all items listed may in fact be discussed. Items not listed may be brought up for discussion to the extent permitted by law. This meeting is being recorded by CTSB and the school committee recorder will be broadcast once transcribed and approved minutes will be made public and posted to our website. This meeting will be recorded by CTSB and by the Berkshire Edge as well. So the first order of business is the Berkshire Hills Regional School District School Committee will enter executive session pursuant to MGL Chapter 38, Section 21A13 to discuss strategy with respect to litigation and open meeting law complaint against the Berkshire Hills Regional School District. Holding discussions in open session may have a de detrimental effect on litigation. Following the executive session, the school committee will reconvene the regular meeting at 6 p.m. Do I have a motion to go into executive session under MGL Chapter 38, Section 21A13? So moved. Second. So I have a, a motion by Bill Fields and second by Bill Hall. <laughs> um, it'll be a roll call vote, Bill. Aye. Bill. Aye. Diane. Yes. Corey. Yes. Sarah. Aye. Aye. Jason. And I. It's unanimous. We shall go into the superintendent's office. Peter, okay. you'll leave that on muted. Okay, are we yeah. on muted? We're on muted. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to call the meeting back to the open session. Yeah, just Okay, we're back in the open session. I'm turning over the superintendent. Okay, uh, thanks everybody. Um, tonight, um, we're, um, we're going to go through the uh, budget. I don't think we've got minutes in this packet. We do not. So we'll start with uh, uh, roses and thorns. Uh, and I think, so we changed our seating around a little bit. So I think it makes sense for the uh, principals to, to come up to one end of the table just to, to share things and, and you can alternate. Um, 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 uh, Miles is out tonight, so he's not, not joining us, so he might be online. Uh, so Katie, can we start with you? So um, last night, there was a wonderful band and string concert for the grade four students. Um, they were very excited. Um, we have um, tomorrow night, PTA is having a craft night, so the families are looking forward to that. And next week, we have uh, Playworks coming. They're going to do a full day with the teachers. They're going to meet some of the kids who are going to be coaches on the playground for the younger kids. Some fourth grade kiddos are applying for that. And um, I don't know. I guess our thorn will probably be a lot of sick, sickness going around. So we're still, I don't know if we're ever going to get rid of this. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. Um, I don't think there are any middle school students. So let's start with our high school student. Hi, and... hi everybody. Hello. Hi. Um, so Basically, this this Saturday we have our Valentine's Day dance, which we're all very excited for. Um, also, a pleasant surprise in the orchestra today. We had some pre-K students come up and dance while we did a, a few songs, which is really really sweet. Um, um, I believe it's next Wednesday, February fourteenth. Um, each sub subcommittee is going to be meeting with some faculty members discussing um, our upcoming goals, which is very exciting. We had a previous one that went really well, so we have the same hopes for this upcoming one. Um, the the um, Environmental Subcommittee of SOB, which I'm a member of, and Ruth Romano here is our facilitator. We're working very hard to open a monument for a store. We already have the designated space for it. Um, our custodians have been very kind to clean it up for us, so we're very excited about getting that up and running. Um, I know that we also have the some people from the swim team qualified for Western Mass. I believe the same applies for 
the wrestling team. Um, I think that's pretty much it for now. Unless Ms. Serena wants to add a few things. We have to shout out our boys basketball team because they're doing amazing this year. So uh, quick congratulations to them because we know that we're going into the tournament. Um, and we also have some skiers, I think, who will be headed um, off to uh, tournament stuff as well. Uh, we have a community breakfast um, that is uh, being organized by our communications and celebrations sub subcommittee. Um, and uh, we have um, there was something else I was going to say, and I don't remember. Uh, the thorn that I would like to share is actually right along the same lines as Katie. I was thinking the thing that I, we're still really struggling with is just the staffing changes. Um, on the upside, uh, we have been able to fill positions that opened mid-year for the most part. We still have our uh, CVTE um, assistant principal uh, position open, but we did find a long-term sub for our social studies position. And we replaced our administrative assistant in the front office and we have a long-term sub in for PE, um, but we have a lot of sickness still in the building. Uh, I guess to balance that off, we have more subs than we had a couple of years ago. So at least we are not scrambling quite as much every day to, to make sure that everything's covered that needs to be. So. Great, thanks. So I, I had two things that sort of on the district level. One's connected to the high school grounds. The, the other night, uh, folks noticed the smell of gas by the high school, and uh, uh, it was the same night as the girls' basketball game. So the, the Great Barrington Police Department and the Fire Department uh, stayed and, and responded to that, and then um, Berkshire Gas came and, and addressed it to a degree at night, and then early the next morning. Um, resolved it, so uh, that was a nice, and also our maintenance people. So that was a nice, uh, that was a nice partnership uh, all around. Uh, on the Thorn side, uh, th there's a, a spot sort of close to the transfer station where somebody's been uh, burning wood, perhaps stumps, and that's created a lot of smoke. And that smoke, the way the wind's blowing, like it goes right to the schools, and, and it's noticeable. So I spoke to the. Um, they were connected with the fire chief about it, and, and he's working on and trying to get that to not happen anymore. Um, so, so th those are two things. Uh, I don't think we have any discrete grant approvals for tonight. Uh, I did put on the agenda a uh, vote to accept school choice students for the uh, next year. We're getting to the point where we um, um, respond to the uh, requests for school choice, and, and each year, the school committee needs to take action on doing it. And usually what you do is you vote to accept it and, and you leave it to, uh, to me to um, uh, figure out where there's space and how to accept kids. So it's my strong recommendation we do it. We get many more school choice students in than we lose. And, and we're, we're very careful to not accept the X plus one student that would then force us to create an additional class or have a a negative impact on, um, uh, on what we're trying to do. So motion to accept school choice students for the fiscal year, or 2025 school year. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed to abstentions? So what is your name on this okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. And now I can reach out to, um, uh, I mean, Doreen does the lottery and all of that, but, but, but we'll, mm -hmm. we'll shortly reach out to families and families. Um, so the, the next thing and really the bulk of the meeting tonight is, is the budget presentation. So I'll pull that up uh, and Sharon and I will, will work through it uh, together. Uh, as and once I put it up, we'll get really focused on so I'll say so a couple of introductory things. Um, um, this, if you've been following through the state news, uh, we're going into uh, what's going to be one of the tougher budget cycles in, in recent memory. Uh, my first year, 15 years ago, there was a really <coughs> tough budget cycle. Uh, and, and, and this could be like that again. What's a little different is um, the last few years, we've had significant additional federal grant money uh, that was tied to the response to COVID and other things, and, and that money 
uh, that we, we use really effectively is, is sunsetting or drying up, right? So, so there's a little uh, less flexibility there. Uh, we still continue to write grants and continue to be successful at doing that, but, but things are, are tighter uh, than, than they have been uh, in, in a while. Uh, so let, let me just give me a sec to pull up the presentation and, uh, and, and then we'll work through that. Okay. Um, so, um, the, the thing, there are a lot of slides, but there's not a lot of information on each of the slides, and I'll work through it. You've got the people in the room have copies in front of you with notes on it. Um, typically, when, when we, we do this, I start with the, uh, the mission uh, to ensure that all students are challenged through a wide range of experiences to become engaged, curious learners, and problem solvers who effectively communicate, respect diversity, and improve themselves uh, and their community. Right, so uh, that's where we start. Um, our budget priorities are uh, to continue to provide high quality education for all students, uh, to continue to provide a range of social and emotional supports. Uh, that would be important in any context, but it's particularly important uh, in these post COVID years. Uh, and in other contexts, I've shared that the impact of that uh, may linger for quite some time. Right? That, that we're, making, we're making progress, but uh, they're, this year's seniors are the ones that started ninth grade during COVID. Uh, and, and, and that's a group that, that I, I uh, continue to focus on, as well as uh, younger students who came into school not necessarily having had as many opportunities to build strong social relationships before they showed up uh, at the course. Um, and then stuff with reading and, and all the rest. Um, so what we're sharing now is our proposed budget. This is our best thinking um, um, at this time. Uh, Sharon and I and, and the principals and, and, and Kate and Colin did a lot of work on this. Uh, we also met regularly with the uh, finance subcommittee. Uh, uh, what often happens is that as I share this, people have questions about it and, and wonder about it. And, and that's what we'll be talking about, uh, maybe a little bit tonight, but, but also the next several meetings. Uh, and then for people who are new to this, uh, then uh, at the point where we're comfortable with it, the school committee uh, would vote on it and then uh, and then send it to the towns and then uh, the towns will vote on it. Okay. Um, so let me start with the first few pages and at a certain point, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Sharon. Okay. So the... Um, first, we'll start with budget changes. So um, at the elementary school, we're, we're, we're really uh, focusing in three areas, uh, reallocating existing resources to meet changing enrollment needs um, as, as needed or as, as necessary. There are clusters or groups of, of young people that, that change by grade. It's tied to birth rate and enrollment. And, and, and in some places we need four sections and in other places we, we can do with three. Uh, and, and that's really what, what happens at, at the elementary school level. Um, one of those is, is our plan to reduce next year's kindergarten from four sections to three sections uh, and, and to continue to support in-depth professional development in math. We're also doing it in, in reading and in literacy like we're highlighting that. Um, but at, at the middle school, uh, we're continuing with four core teams and specials, uh, continued emphasis on, on professional development for SEL or, or uh, social emotional learning, and the potential reallocation of one FTE or full-time equivalent from the middle school uh, to, to potentially the, the elementary school. Uh, there, there are two sort of sets of subgroups that, that 
shift some uh, English language learners can shift as they sort of just where they are, right? Like what grade and age they're in, uh, and, and also uh, uh, special education students or students with, with particular learning needs. Sometimes they're they're more in the middle school and then they move as a cohort <laughs> to the high school and, and vice versa. Um, at the at the high school, um, uh, continued work um, around uh, and review and planning around uh, CDTE, career vocational and technical education. Uh, Christy and I had a very good call this morning or early afternoon with our state uh, liaison there uh, and, and talked about that. Um, we anticipate uh, reducing uh, our math staffing by half a full-time equivalent, reducing a social studies position by one full-time equivalent uh, and, and likely one other full-time equivalent reduction. Um, and, and where we're able to do it by uh, retirements or attrition, we do it and where we're not, then, 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 we, then we do it other ways. All of this is tied to student enrollment. So enrollment goes up and down uh, and sometimes our, our staffing is, is consistent with uh, that enrollment and, and sometimes it, it lags a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Let me then make a clear demarcation. You know what? Let, let me go through these and, and then I'll let you do the next section. Um, so uh, health and dental insurance is, is a, a, obviously a, a big part of our budget. Uh, we're anticipating a 5.39% total increase in health or a little more than $300,000. Um, Berkshire Health Group set rates were set at seven. Um, but um, but what that means in relation to everybody and who gets insurance and who doesn't and who's on family plans and all of that uh, changes. Uh, in the last several years, we had had premium holidays. We are not having a premium holiday um, um, this year. Is that 100% that time? At this time, they didn't vote on that, that's, Okay. I didn't mean to interrupt you, I'm sorry. No, I, I, no feel, feel free, I, and maybe they will, right? Uh, no, which, yeah, that, which, which would be great. Uh, and, and there's no change uh, in, in our dental rates, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but in, in sort of the <laughs> inflationary cycle, we're in sort of a big deal. Uh, the the uh, Medics rate uh, changes in January it was a 5.5% increase, but the actual hit to us is a 4.07%. What is Medics? Can you uh, Medics on? is the Medicare supplemental insurance. Oh. Okay. And ours happens to have the Part D equivalent for prescriptions. Um, the, the Berkshire County retirement, so this is for the non-certified staff, uh, is going up 4.07% to uh, $41,836. Um, um, and, and some of you will like this, the educational services and tuition is decreasing by 2.15% uh, for $42,500. Uh, and, and transportation is an increase of 11.04% or $293,826. And, and, uh, and, and Sharon, can you just remind that, people what that, that means? Right. So the transportation costs per bus increased by the CPI, which was about 2.85%. Uh, we have a number of students, as you've heard from Kate, that are in out-of-district placements and they're in day placements. So this includes that transportation. 85% of this increase is actually due to that transportation. But that does not include the extracurricular transportation, which is in another line item. Right, that, that's included in the operating budget at, under the athletics and activities. Yeah. A um, couple more. Uh, technology is an increase of 30.45%, uh, a, a little more than $105,000. Uh, and that's both software and, and refresh of, of devices. 
over time, if you look at our budget longitudinally, we're spending less money on techs and more money on, on technology. Um, and facilities and operations, a slight increase of 1.84% or $12,050. Um, utilities um, um, continue to go up 2.24% uh, or $21,920. Um, educational supplies, materials, and equipment, an increase of 4.05% or uh, $16,350. And professional development is a decrease of 0.77% or $1,050. Uh, much of our professional development budget exists outside of our, uh, outside of our regular budget and is, is grant funded. So when you look at the professional development line, we, we don't spend um, uh, as much as one might want to spend, but we, we cover that with, with grants. Um, so why don't I, I turn it over to Sharon for the, oh, I'm sorry. So le legal and other insurances, um, um, a decrease of 2.31%, uh, almost $4,000, and other administrative costs, an increase of 1.06% or $4,000. So those sort of uh, wash each other out. Uh, let me turn it over to Sharon to start talking about the operating budget and the capital budget. And then the thing that I think people are, are most interested in, um, uh, what, like what's the bottom line? What does this mean for the, the towns and, and their assessments? Great. So we'll go to the next slide. So the operating budget, the gross operating budget, which is the total budget before we subtract the revenue from choice and tuition. So the gross operating budget is 35,039,758 or an increase of 1,517,900 for a 4.53%. And that's reflective of all the changes that Peter had talked about. So what we did was we broke down the changes by category that Peter talked about and also as a percentage of the change. So salaries increased 4.14% and 50% 50.56% uh, of the total change, which makes sense because it's over 75% of our total budget is salaries and benefits or 767,403. Benefits, that's health insurance. Um, it includes unemployment. It includes separation benefits for retirement, increased 4.46, and that's 20.97% or 318,271. Again, transportation is, the category is 11.04%, and it's the next highest change at 19.36 or 293,826. Again, 85% of that is due to out of district transportation. And the, the key to that is that allows our, our students to come back to our community. That's why the day placements are really good. They, they get to be part of our community. Sure. And, and Sharon, the transportation, um, that's contractual, correct? Because we have, we're in the third year or the five year? Yes. It's contractual for the bus company, but we also, for our out of district transportation, we have to use other companies because everyone's short on drivers. So we use other commercial companies. And the salary numbers, that's by contract, by union contract, for the most part? For the most part, yeah, yeah. by union contract. And the same with benefits, I assume. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the thing though, the, like so the, all three of those lines end up drawn. Right. right. That's right. What I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> the, but the, the salary doesn't mean everybody's getting that raise. Right. Some people are, are earning master's degrees or second yeah. master's degrees and, and as well as as uh, increasing in, in seniority. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Technology, the category change, as Peter said, 30.45%, and it's 6.9% of the total at 105,500. Because we're also going from 
hard copies to software. We also have to keep our devices updated. Educational services and tuition, that includes out of district um, tuition expenses, any kind of evaluation services, that's 5.62, and that's 5.75% of the total change or $105,000. Then we get into the smaller- So you're saying our total tuition out for special ed is 105,000 right now? No, that is the change. It's oh, it's a change, okay. Right. Anyways, yes. Yeah, no, it's, like it's about one point. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. There's a lot of transportation costs for that though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, that's just the increase. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> Educational supplies and materials, 1.08% of change or 16,350. Activities and athletics, that's where the other transportation is in for field trips and athletics. Uh, changes at 13.61% or just 1.71 of the total change, $26,000. The bulk of that is for athletic transportation because of the where we have to go now for our games. Utilities at 2.42 or 1.44% of the change, 21,920. Facilities and operations, 1.84. It's only 0.79% of the change at $12,050. Other administrative costs, that's um, printing and copying, some of the costs up here. The uh, school committee category change of 1.06% or 2.26% of the total, 4,000. Legal and other insurance is down 2.31% or a quarter of a percent. And that's basically, we were able to decrease the amount for special education legal services because we don't anticipate as much. As Peter said, professional development is down. Um, 0.77 at 0 0.07 of the total or $1,050. <clears throat> and that, that's the total change. And the next thing we've done um, is, a, is budget by department. And we started doing this a few years ago because there was sort of a uh, misunderstanding that when we have a you know, $33, $35 million budget, and each of the schools looks at what their discretionary spending is, not so much the administrators, but you know, a lot of the staff question, well, the district must have a lot of money because we don't have that much. So we then reallocated and looked at it a little differently and said, of all those expenses we looked at, where does the money actually go? What department does it go to? So the first one is 19, almost 20%, of the budget is for the elementary school, 16.82% for the middle school, high school is 26.32, and then student services plus ELL is 10.43. So over 73% of that budget is directly in the schools, teachers, paras, supplies, um, activities. <laughs> then transportation and food service, which is also a direct <clears throat> um, support in the schools, which is why the little box is there, is at 8.42%. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, district wide, all other is 13.9, but that also includes our non public transportation. We're obligated to transport our resident students to, in, to the private schools that are in our district. It's retiree health insurance, the contingency for salary school choice, all those that don't fit in the <clears throat> schools themselves. School committee and administration is 1.82, so that includes the district office, and then facilities and maintenance is 2.55%, which makes sense because that includes all the grounds, wastewater, water vault, and then we have a nice little chart. Thank you. <clears throat> You so, can't read it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the pie chart just essentially shows it's like another way of presenting where, where the investments right. are, and, and the big blue one is salary and benefits, right? And it's 76.45%. And then the next biggest one is transportation uh, and, and on and on. Can I ask just a 
maybe this is an editorial comment. Mm -hmm. Transportation. I looked in the big book and to transport kids to BCD and Steiner is $140,000. Mm -hmm. Is there any, how are we required to pay that? I, is case this a law. legislative case mandate? <clears throat> yeah, well, it's case law mandate. Case law. The, the reasoning is that those resident students, their families pay taxes in our district, which makes them eligible to share in the district's budget. And, even and, though they're okay. private. Right. and their, their existence <clears throat> generates revenue or, or money for, for the district as well. Okay, all right. I didn't I didn't realize that it's a revenue enhancer in a way. It just how is it revenue? Yeah, enhancer? how is it? Because it's 140,000 we're paying. No, 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 not not that that we're paying does it, but yeah. can you explain how we're the the we get credit with, for those kids in calculation of yes. our chapter 70 monthly to try stuff? No. no. Not in charge of any those kids tend they come back to us also. Right. So no. I mean it's it's a rip off. It's a rip off with yeah. okay. that. We we've argued yeah. with this. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. I've argued with yeah. the commissioner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. but it, it's it's case law. Uh, okay. All right. And it's basically because right. the family I'll never ask that question again. Yeah. Oh, you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Somebody asked that every three years. It's like my question about right. why it's case is law. The school choice number hasn't changed in 30 years, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I think there was a point, Bill, where I wanted a motion to say we're not going to do this and share this, this, and our legal fees would just be as high as. Part of the the challenge is because the in our district, the private school um, schedule doesn't work with our schedule right. to have them drop. So, for example, in Pittsfield, I talked to the business administrator, they drop, their students are on their regular transportation, and it's just another stop to drop them off at the private school. Why can't we do that? Because the schedules don't align. Whose responsibility is it for the schedules to align, to align on our end? Right. I mean, can we just say our right, these buses are going at this time and this time? No, we can't. We have to provide that transportation. No matter what their schedule. So mm -hmm. if they said we're starting at three in the morning and we're getting done at seven at night, that would be our responsibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. Case law. <laughs> <laughs> That's Where's the same the question next year. But it's the same. <laughs> and what about going to the state, pushing back it off an increased transportation cost on the athletic side because it was a change that was put upon us. Yeah. That pushed the additional. That's an MIA. It, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's more an MIA thing yeah. than than the state. Uh, and I mean, I, every time I I approve a bus to the cave or something, it's it's. it's I, I will say hours. Carl's done a good job massaging the schedule the last couple of years. Right. To kind of reduce some of the, it's impossible to do, but yeah. I would realign the girls' soccer team to get more local games. It's, it's, I mean, it's, I know. It's, Throwing sand back in the ocean, but it's right. It would always it would be really nice if the MIAA, which changed this whole thing to favor the eastern part of the state, would um, through their fees or something be able to reimburse school districts such as us for um, the, the the inordinate amount of travel. Yeah. Right. Because and, the MIAA just banned and was replaced by an organization that cares about kids. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> themselves. Yeah. Why yeah. have we made any effort like? If Carl or anyone ever made an effort to approach the MIA with this idea? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think they talk about it, and I think uh, uh, athletic directors that are, are geographically separated from the rest of the state bring it up. Uh, we, we can bring it up so that, that um, um, Carl brings it up at the next meeting. Christy, do you know, is there any effort to address it? The number of communities that this impacts is relatively small. small. Like the the vast majority of communities in the state of Massachusetts that because all of the communities had to vote on this, like all of the athletic directors had a vote. We <coughs> voted no. Our vote doesn't exactly. have enough of an impact, even collectively with other communities that are in the same boat as us, because 
the number of us are so small, small. right like it's, so we don't have power and numbers on that side but the flip side is that if it's not going to cost that much because it's only a small number of communities that are being impacted maybe the MIA would be inclined to do something. I don't know. I just feel like it's worth just the principle of it bothers me mm -hmm. so much. I would be happy to ask that this is the same organization that made me drive to Cape Cod to do a training that I could have done virtually because that's just their rule. And if I didn't, we were going to be removed from the organization. So I understand your frustration and I'm equally frustrated. <laughs> So if we were removed from the MIAA, yeah, what happened? What would that mean? <laughs> we would no longer be able to participate in the leagues, and would, our students wouldn't oh, be able okay. to participate in the tournaments. And oh, okay. right. I think we want that opportunity yeah, no, for right. our students. So I was just thinking when we went we through. Have uh, to accept this. Yeah. I just thought, Christy, we, I was thinking along the lines of when we dropped out of the um, NESC because the accreditation process was so expensive. Yeah, and then we did our own, and we haven't. Suffered at all. I think, but, I, I, to but it's different. Your own group with athletics might yeah. be really challenging yeah. okay. all right. to find contenders. Yeah. For yeah. Our okay. Okay. You know, Dan. Yes. So we talked about the gross operating budget. Then when we look at the difference between the gross operating and net, it's due to the reduction by choice and tuition. Choice is based level is based on current projections. Who we have where we see openings, tuition level is based on, again, the students we have and looking at the students that will be graduating either eighth or sixth grade at Farmington River. And that net operating budget is, <clears throat> excuse me, 33,014,758, our same amount of the increase or 4.82% increase. And that's, be that's because of the difference of what the net was last year. Capital budget. Um, the good news, we have a gross operate, operating, I'm sorry, that should say gross capital budget of 533,750 or a decrease of 1,183,125 or 68.91%. And that's because we paid off the bonds this year, which was great. So the, the expense that's in there now is $500,000, which um, to be allocated to, or recommended to be allocated to the stabilization fund for future, either future maintenance, high maintenance costs, or to reduce assessments in the future. Short-term interest, uh, last year, the school committee, last year, the year before the school committee approved a $1.5 million borrowing for the feasibility and schematic design project with the MSBA. Because we participated before and they paid for part of the project, they don't do it a second time. So we are, are responsible for all of it. Even though it's the 1.5, We've worked with our treasurer and our investment advisor, and based on the timing of our borrowing, the 33,750 should be enough to cover the borrowing. because we're not gonna borrow until later in, in the year. A revenue, as you can see, most of it comes from our assessments. Minimum local contribution is 33%, and then the additional local, that's above what the minimum is, uh, obviously, is 47%. So the 80% comes from our communities, which we really appreciate. It. Chapter 70 is 10%. Our E&D is 2%. Choice is approximately 5% of the revenue. Chapter 71, 2%. And then all other revenue, which includes um, Medicaid, E-rate, interest, uh, is all other. The END of the 2%, our FY23 certified is 792,101 or equivalent to 2.27% of the FY24. Each year END is certified and it can be no more, it's like retained earnings for a private business. It can be no more than 5% 
of the subsequent year's budget. 617,000 is used to offset the operating budget, which represents 77.89% of our E&D balance. So it leaves us a little bit in case there's something urgent that comes up that you might need. Now, now to the meat of it, assessments. There are three considerations. Population allocation, which you see in the October report, the minimum local contribution, which you, if you look at the book, you see as part of the asset budget, and then the net assessment, which is the net operating, the net capital, less all of the revenue sources. So first is the population allocation. And for Great Barrington, it went down 0.38% from 645 students. Um, that's the wrong one. Yeah. Um, it went, yeah, it went down. So the numbers are, are a little reversed here. No, I think the I think those are the right numbers. I think the percentage. The percentage. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And then the Stockbridge, the percentage went down 1.63% of the total. And West Stockbridge, and this is going to be important, went up 3.92% of the total. So again, that's one of the three uh, impacts for the assessment. Then the minimum local contribution. The, what I have quoted is the law, and it's basically saying they're going to do the foundation budget. They're going to figure out how much each town has capacity to spend on school. That's the minimum they need to spend, which in our case, the total between all three towns is 11 million, just over $11 million. And then it's allocated over the three towns. The difference between the foundation budget, the total to be spent, Minimum local is this chapter 70. So minimum local contribution for Great Barrington went from 8 million 90,456 to 8 million 593,682. And that's an increase of about 6.22%. Stockbridge's minimum local contribution went from 1,569,211 to 1,693,659 or 7.93. And West Stockbridge went from 1,360,800 to 1,499,728. That's an increase of 10.21%. So that's important to remember that they have higher increases as a percentage in both the students and the minimum local. And you'll see what that does in a second. So the net assessments changed for Great Barrington from 20,333,733 to 21,040,872. Stockbridge from 3,733,143 to 3,866,686. And then West Stockbridge is up from 300. 390, 3,391,845 to 3,653,683. And then the next page shows what the impact, the next slide. So the total assessment, net assessment change is 4.02. And the change to Great Barrington is 3.48 at 707,138. Stock is 3.58% at 133,543. And then West Stockbridge, 7.72% increase at 261,838. So when people ask why Stockbridge is, I mean, West Stockbridge is so much higher, <coughs> you look at the percentage increase of the total students and the percentage increase of the minimum local contribution. And that, and then the just the net assessment increase, and that's why they have such a large, a larger increase than the other two communities. Question? Questions? The minimum local contribution is based on property values. It's based on the combined effort, which is 
the property values, equalized property values, and income. And then there's a little percentage in, the, in there for the foundation budget increase. The foundation budget starts with, um, first it starts with, there's, there's a table that says for a kindergarten student that is a regular ed student, you get, it's, it, you get X amount of dollars allocated for that. For a kindergarten student, special ed, you know, they come up with the full budget and then they say, okay, you have a number of students, 15, and that, the average is 15,000 foundation budget. And then they use that, they look at the wealth of the community, they use that 15,000 and then they do the whole formula. So it's, it's the foundation budget plus the relative wealth of a community. So they and look at they look it's it's like an aggregate of personal tax returns. They, so what? they they look at personal tax returns from the community, yeah. and they, yeah. it's not I mean, we can't tax people's income, but they use that as a threat for how much time they pay. And then each community, the max of the total obligation is at individually eighty two point five percent of their portion of the foundation budget, and then the, the state fills in the rest. It's $11 million. We, we, as you can see, looking at the budgets, we could have like two and a half schools, but no grounds, no superintendent. And so that's the minimum. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I know, Peter, you alluded to the fact that some of the cuts at the high school were due to drops in student enrollment, but mm -hmm. I'm hearing from people that are upset about the cuts. And so, is it, can you give any more? Kind of explanation is into the thought process to why those positions and those departments. Yeah, um, uh, I mean there are a whole bunch of things, right? I I I expect people to get upset, right? It, it, it's hard when they're they're reductions. So so on the highest level, there there shifts in enrollment, right? Not so many years ago, we had five hundred and thirty five students, and in, in recent memory, we had more than. 600 students, right? The number, I didn't look at it today. Chris, do you have to remember what the number is today? Uh, yes, 456, I was just on doing it. Okay, so, so, so 456, right? So the difference between 535 and 456 is, is, is significant. Um, and, and we looked at this and that, in the ideal world, we wouldn't make any cuts, right? I'd be coming to you asking you for additional resources and, and adding positions, but but you look at, at sort of class sizes and how kids break out and where we're investing and in, in making choices and 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 then and then we do it around that. We try to make decisions that and people argue about this, right? But we try to make decisions that are 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 least impactful on on teachers and, and learning. Um, the, 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 the fewer reductions at the elementary school and the middle school, and, and they have less room for those reductions. And, and the high school is, is bigger in total numbers, but it's also staffed differently. And there was a little more flexibility uh, uh, this round at, at the high school. The other thinking is if you, if you uh, uh, invest and I wasn't saying more, but if you invest in the elementary school and, and you set things up right, then uh, then um, you don't have to invest as much later on. But the challenge is what's interesting about the high school or, or for that matter, any high school is the range of varied opportunities, right? And, and we're trying to, to offer really exciting vocational opportunities and in a wide range of academic opportunities. And uh, there, there are other districts that, that have made different choices that, that we've not made, right? We, we uh, uh, sustain investments in, in, in multiple areas that, that, that we care about. Uh, for a, a district or even a school of our size that, that we run the range of programs we run is, is quite uh, unusual. So I don't, I don't know if that totally gets, gets yeah, to it. I don't think it does. Because I think what, what would help, I think, is people understanding kind of the thought process, not so much why it's happening at the high school, but how those positions 
get identified, I think. Yeah. And maybe that's a level of specificity that you can't go into. Yeah, they could get that. No, I'm happy to go I just, into I it. I think and bringing people along on the challenges and on the ride helps yeah, and I mean, helps in, in the overall understanding. Yeah, so let's have Christy speak in really explicit detail. Maybe, Christy, one of the things you can touch on is sort of not, not in number of classes, but in how many people we carry in each department and, and sort of what that means in relation to what what we're teaching. And, and in some areas, we, we have an expectation that all students do something for four years and in other areas, less than that. So when I, when I was asked to look at what could be potential cuts that I would consider in the context of this budget, the first thing I did was look at enrollment um, across the four main content areas was where I was really focused. Um, and that is directly connected to what Peter described in terms of our overall enrollment going down from my first year, we were at 525. Um, and this is my fifth year, down to 456. And that's a pretty substantial drop. In addition to that, during the COVID years, there was actually a couple of places where we increased our staffing. So in social studies, we, when I took the principalship, we were staffed at 5.5 uh, full time in social studies, we're, we are now staffed at six. In the math department, we were at 5.5 when I took the principalship, we're now staffed at six. So we had places where we had actually increased during COVID, and I think that, that for very good reasons, um, but now we're coming out of that and I had to look at enrollment numbers. The other thing I, I would share is I really did try to distribute this across the departments and I don't know that it was framed exactly correctly in the presentation. So the presentation suggested that there is a 1.0 cut in social studies and that is not 100% accurate. There is, a, a, there is an open position right now, well it's not open, it's filled with a long-term sub and we would just be not hiring for that position, but we do have a science teacher who has certification in social studies that would pick up some social studies sections. So we would be reducing the number of sections in social studies and reducing the number of sections in science. Same thing with math. We have a part-time math teacher that's teaching two classes, so that's 0.4, reducing that position. I have three science teachers that are also certified in math. So I was looking for ways that I could make reductions or propose reductions where I would have the most flexibility on the ground to make decisions based on the enrollment that comes out this year uh, for course numbers. The, um, the English cut was a cut that we had um, discussed last year and then um, through grant funding proposed the reading and writing interventionist position and that position was the position that I don't think we had gotten into the specifics, but that was the one I was looking at um, because we had already reduced in English. Yeah, that helps a lot. Thanks so, for, for yeah. Can I ask one more question? Though? Just with oh, that yeah. drop, well, with the drop, is that something we need to be concerned about? Is that something we need to talk about? Um, is, is that so, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. <laughs> so my understanding, and I've talked to Miles about this in terms of enrollment coming in from the middle school, this freshman class is one of the smallest classes. Um, and it was a small class going all the way back. Like, I think it's the grade that back in the middle school, there were only three sections and it was the, it was like this weird dip instead of a bump that came through. Um, I, I anticipate next year, our enrollment will hold pretty steady. The graduating class right now is at 105 and I predict we'll get, I predict we'll get at least that, maybe even a, a little bit more in the incoming class. So our numbers could go up just a tad. Um, I think I think we'll be steady for a few years. Um, the, the one thing, so the the, the freshmen is, or the ninth graders is a small class. The current um, juniors, it's 136 or 138. It's a very large class. So it it, it, it and the largest class in over a decade graduated two years ago. But we saw that number for yeah, I and mean, they were still here during COVID. A lot of people were hired, and they were. Yeah, they graduated 154, which was like a decade high. So yeah. 
Um, so, I mean, it, we, Sharon's done this in other contexts. We could we could we could share some predictions around that going forward. The the total enrollment of a high school will, in some ways, be down because of that one small class. And then when that class graduates, then then we might see a, a, a bump. In the context of the MSBA process, they I think the number. Uh, is 485, which is where I think we'll be um, we'll be close to, and, and then if, if we expand some additional uh, CBDE programs, that, that might draw some additional students, and and depending on where we land with a, a building, there's a, a bump built into that too. So what's yeah. interesting is that the MSBA did two different studies to figure out what they would allow us to build 485 right. and we're at what right now 456 so obviously they anticipate we're going to have an increase over the years and their studies are usually pretty right on yeah very much right on there the one thing i would share that came up um, in my meetings with um, teachers around this and i think they're right in expressing this is that while our numbers have decreased the student need yeah. has increased yeah. as a result of both the pandemic and the shifting demographics that they're trying to serve. So yeah. I just do, we do have to always keep that in mind that the numbers are important, um, but student need is equally important as we're thinking about these decisions. And they're hard ones, I mean, they're not easy decisions to make, but I do just want to make that because it came up. So. That's true, and we're at an all-time high on non-classroom staff. We have that in the Hill history of the school, exactly. and that's not being touched by this one. Christy, can I just yeah. ask? <laughs> in, in the decision, in the decision just just pull up. Yeah. <laughs> if I hear you right, the science teacher that's certified in social studies is going to pick up some of the slack of the the reduction and not being filled. Correct. My concern there, I, I know I'm I'm maybe out of my ballpark here in regards to. Um, being a school committee person, and I know it's an administrative decision, is uh, my concern is on the elective program. And the social studies department has been strong in the electives. I'm very concerned about how many electives will be offered with this position being eliminated. Um, I'm hearing though, in a way, it's, and maybe I'm wrong, is that is this science teacher gonna pick up like three sections? Possibly. Which would which would minimize the two or three is what I would imagine. And again, I, I think <clears throat> it's going to be when we see the student enrollment numbers for next year that those decisions are going to have to be made. And it's not unlike any year. It's just this year will be a little more complicated if we're having some cross department conversations in terms of teacher assignment. Um, it is nice when there are teachers in departments that have yeah, right. additional certifications yeah. because of the flexibility it, it provides. So. so that's a possibility to minimize this reduction. Correct. Okay. And that's a real tension, right? Like how Oh yeah, I, I understand that. We're, we're excited about our electives. How many right. electives can we offer in a in a tighter budget year? Yeah. Right. And, and maybe you don't offer a full range of electives every year, but you offer them every other year. And, and from a kid's perspective, or a young person's perspective, they still get to enroll in electives. We're just not offering 10 simultaneously. We're offering eight or six. I just had one question. So with this leveling up um, process, we're going through class size, teacher ratio is, you know, what I've learned the most important thing to success or failure. And it really, it seems like the freshman and sophomore years is the main thing. With these changes and these shifts, are you still going to be at the levels that you're satisfied with? And do you think the teachers will be um, able to that's the be goal. successful? Um, and this year, we're sh we were unable to fill our, our uh, one-year position in biology, and it bumped our biology numbers up as a result. I, we did our best, but the, the numbers are actually closer to like 24, 25. Um, and it's it's too many, frankly. Like Which, we can't so that, was a, that, was, that was a hiring, <laughs> not a budgeting issue. 
That is a hiring issue that I just yeah, did want to name that. that I yeah. think when the sections get that large in this context, it's too large. Like 24 is not a huge class, but in the context of this um, structure, it's too large of a class. Really, the sweet spot, I think, is like 16 to 22, probably max. My question would so. be, follow up would be, is what we're asking of them the reason why we're having trouble filling it because it's a difficult no that was just a one-year posting one year. and that is that was, was after the ninth or tenth grade that we had 24 people in that that was ninth okay. it's a, it's our ninth graders in science so and that was a, it was a late biology one-year posting i'm not surprised we, we struggled to fill it and we did like our best to to balance the classes but just seeing how it played out this year with the larger class sizes in biology in particular i it can't say that there's not an impact right of course there's an impact well we're going to see how the scores i mean the last two you know, <laughs> the, the one tangible success we've had is the biology scores you know the english and the math not so much um so um those are the ones i'm more concerned about to be honest with you so we'll see Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so the the math curriculum, which I know we approved and was very much supported two three years ago, and we're at like a twenty plus bump every year on it. How long is that going to continue for? I support it. I'm just I don't. I remember having this big discussion about it. This is line three twenty five, I guess. So the, 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 the our, our investment in illustrative math. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if that if, it, if it's in the perpetuity, I'm fine with that. I'm yeah, just, I, I, I don't, my, don't, my sense of it is that, and I'll do a little research and come back to you. That some of those materials, it's not disposable is not the right word. What's the right word, Crystal? Consumable. Consumable, right? <laughs> not disposable. <laughs> Consumable. Uh, so uh, uh, they, they're they're consumable materials. So I think we we're we're committed to making that investment year after year. Okay. Anyone else? I just want to sure. as we were doing the cycle last year, you talked about um, doing like a a budget one hundred and one for staff starting in the fall. And I was wondering if that happened. No, and, and I feel badly about that. There, there was something I had hoped to do, and we talked about it and. Uh, and it's still it, it, we, we, we will do it, but we, we didn't do it um, this fall. And, and I mean, one thing like, I, I appreciate how many people are on this call, right? There, there's 73 uh, people on, on the call, and, and, and a large number of them are, are staff or colleagues. Um, so we will continue to talk on this. Uh, you have a little additional context. The, the budget books, or the, the online budget, are, are on the, the district's website. They're, they're, uh, they're the budgets are in libraries, right? If people want to look at those, that they're extra uh -huh. uh, town halls, are extra copies here. Uh, and, and I think that the good homework for folks is to uh, read through them, highlight things, and, and, and let's continue to uh, um, to talk about it. So our public hearing is the seventh. Am I correct about that? Twenty nine. Twenty nine. Okay. Yeah. Which is our next meeting? Yes. yes. Yeah. So questions can be brought up then, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And Absolutely. there can be changes. There could be possibly changes made at that time. But we usually don't make any changes after the public hearing. So yes. Okay. Um. Uh, right. And then the other thing, and I think Sharon shared this in the previous meeting, so, so we know what the, the governor's proposed budget is, but, but the House and Senate are working on theirs, and then it gets reconciled. And there's a possibility uh, it might change, which which is unusual about the governor's budget is, is while there, there are reductions in some areas from an education standpoint, it was, it was pretty generous. Yeah. Uh, so it'll be interesting. I, I'm not well, there'll be no changes before we vote, though. No. 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 Unfortunately, the backwards way we do things. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, other things, and I think we shared this last meeting. Actually, I can't recall. Uh, uh, we we did our meetings and, and um, interviews with our architect designer, and and we 
uh, uh, made a recommendation. Uh, the contract is being negotiated with them. We're waiting to hear back from the MSBA on that. But um, uh, we, we selected Denisco and and uh, uh, William Ron. It's really the Denisco contract, and William Ron is a a well-known architect, uh, an architectural firm that's, that's partnering uh, with them on it. And we had an initial meeting and Jason, maybe in the next section, you talk more about it, but we're excited. Yeah, very excited. So I think people will be very happy with this group. Yeah. Okay. Um, subcommittee reports. Um, policy subcommittee will meet March 12th. Buildings and grounds. Have not met. Superintendent's evaluation. March 7th. March 7th at 5. Finance? Uh, we met yesterday and just went over all this, basically the presentation that you guys saw today. So there's nothing, you heard everything on that. Um, traditionally, we've had another finance committee meeting before the public hearing based on things that are elicited at the presentation, but I didn't hear anything today that necessarily necessitates it. But if people have things they want to discuss, Ask questions of the administration before it, just let me know and we can schedule a finance committee meeting. But unless anybody says they want to have one, there, there's a tentative one scheduled for 4 30 the day of the public yeah. hearing. So, yeah, if we have the yeah, that we can just put it in. Yeah, but I mean, that's that was there to in case of like, right? I'm yeah. saying if we have like people want to, say yeah, that. exactly. <laughs> that would be on the 20th. So that would be the one, yeah, right before. So, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree with Rick. I don't see a reason we're going to need one, but something could have changed. This way, have a date there. Uh, negotiations has not started. Do, but, uh, do you want to share the thing that we're holding dates for the interest based bargaining training? Yes, uh, on March 5th and 6th. Uh, and, and an interesting thing that there used to be. Dozens of interest based bargaining trainers in Massachusetts, and, and a whole gaggle of them retired at the same time. So we reached out to the uh, Federal Mediation and Reconciliation Service, and they're able to, to do that. And it's our tax dollars at work. So no cost to us. That's good. Personnel report? Uh, yeah. So uh, a couple of things that I'm flagging, and, and I updated this. Uh, we're we're trying to fill a, a librarian position at the elementary school. Um, we did fill the, the directed study coordinator there, but that created an additional vacancy for a, a secretary. So there's a lateral move. So we're working on that. Uh, nothing for the moment at the middle school. And then uh, Christy earlier mentioned the CBT assistant principal. So we're, we're not optimistic that we're going to find somebody at this point in the school year. So we anticipate uh, working with two retired folks as consultants to help us move the work now while we launch a bigger search for a, a, an assistant principal now to start after July 1. Um, so um, it, it's listed sort of twice there. Um, um, we will move ahead with consultants for the time being while we try to fill the position for, for next fiscal year. Uh, and, and the rest of it are, are uh, 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 stipends and, and, and one resignation of thank Natasha Switzer for her work as a, as a parent in middle school. Any old or new business? Any public comment? So if, if people are online and, and they have questions, you can raise your hand and we will uh, recognize you. And in the room too? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, sorry. Sorry. More importantly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, we got both of them. Josh Corporates, go ahead. Oh, she was here in the room. I go back and forth. I alternate. Uh, uh, sorry. Hi, so, thank you. Up. I just had a quick, <clears throat> I just had a very quick question. Um. Uh, I was just looking, uh, just you had invited people to educate themselves before the public, uh, before the public hearing uh, in a few weeks. Um, and I was just going through the budget book, which is a, as comprehensive as ever. Thank you, Sharon. Um, but I'm wondering just for, for those of us who maybe aren't great at reading the lines, and it's possible that I missed this, is there any way that a, a publicly available kind of one sheet with what the proposed cuts are, just so people can 
understand what those are would be made available. And I apologize if it's actually in the budget book. I've been looking through it and I don't seem to see anything like that, like a simple breakdown of of what the uh, what the material changes will be in the budget. I think that might be helpful for the public so that everyone's coming into the hearing with with accurate information. Yeah, well, we'll put the PowerPoint presentation online. Perfect. Thank that, you. Yeah, that makes sense. Come on. Just uh, I don't know where it is. You can come on up. Yeah, come on up. Yeah. Then people can hear you. Yes. Uh, hi, Kelsey Romano, she, her pronoun, I'm a special education teacher at Monument Mountain. I am the SOD environmental committee advisor. Um, I am also the GSA advisor and the SOCO students of color advisor. Um, one of the positions that was not discussed that is being cut is the DEI coordinator, the DEIB, I guess, coordinator. Um, this position was newly created based on the data collected from the Stokes Collective. Um, considering the large number of concerns we've had about um, inclusion and ensuring like that our staff and students are anti-racist and accepting, the fact that this is one of the first things on the chopping block is honestly like horrifying. Um, if we truly believe in this work, then it is something we are going to pr prioritize um, because if we want to create a space that helps students really be ready for the world, be ready for like what is next and to create a community that is more inclusive and like that say teachers of color or um, different types of people would want to come work in, then we need someone to help uh, invest in that. And by cutting this position, we are really saying that it's not something we believe in, which is really disappointing. So yes. just as the as a white, cis, hetero person who is in charge of these clubs that are supposed to be supporting our marginalized students, like which is problematic in itself, like we need more adults in the building that represent our students. And our DEIB coordinator is one of the people who would help make that environment possible. And without her, I'm not sure that that work would be really moving forward. So that is it. Thank, thank you. Yeah, no, th thanks, for, um, thanks for bringing it up. In, in some ways, we did make some real progress. We, we hired uh, three additional uh, staff of color uh, this past year, teachers, and, and two of them were previously paraprofessionals. Uh, who, who became teachers. So, so that's a, a nice step in, in one direction. Uh, and, and this decision or recommendation wasn't made lightly. I think we can support some of the work um, um, with, with consultants and, and use our resources differently. But, but I also get that it's a, it's a punch to the gut. That, that we were able to, to create the position and then are, are potentially stepping away from it. Right. Finally, the newsletter. I was wondering what's happening with the position of English teacher at the middle school. Is that still a long-term vacancy? Is somebody Teaching the class. You have a long term sub in there. Yeah, we have, we have a, we have a sub in there. But there's a long term sub in there right now. Okay, thank you. Ted Collins. You're on mute, Ted. Feel free to comment. Oh, he's connecting. Yeah. 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 Let me give a second. And I'll... Then I'm going to come back to you. Rebecca Honig. Yes. Hi. Um, our uh, Rebecca Honig, Tieringham, three children in the school. Our daughter, uh, who's in 10th grade, came home from her recent sob meeting and said, mom and dad, they're gonna cut the DEI position. And 
I came to this meeting and I listened and I heard nothing. I didn't hear it come up. So I'm texting her, <gasps> you're wrong. I think you were wrong. And now I come to understand she's not in fact wrong. And I'm, I'm just in total shock. I, I can't believe given this current climate that would even be a consideration given the deep and enduring work we need to do, given the commitments we've made that have been made over and over again at these meetings, given what we understood after the Stokes report. I mean, that was chapter one of this work. We, we have so many chapters ahead of us. There is that amazing quote, you know, don't tell me your priorities, show me your budget and I'll tell you your priorities. And I just feel like we need to remember that in this moment. Um, this has to be a priority. I'm just, please, please do not cut that position. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Ted, are you, have you fixed your technical problems? <laughs> oh, my. Sarah Mudridge, excuse me, but. Hi, no, that was great. <laughs> Thank you. Sarah Muggeridge, Monterey. Uh... Oops, my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. Um, starting at Sarah Muggeridge, Monterey, a uh, parent of a child in the middle school and another child in the high school. Um, and I, I actually appreciate uh, you're making the, the budget available. Um, I do understand from past meetings and also um, Peter speaking on WAMC that we should be looking out for um, training for um, staff, um, I believe at all levels, um, but training for staff in terms of um, inclusion, in terms of being able to, to sort of hold spaces, these affinity spaces that were already mentioned tonight, but also in the classrooms. And um, I just wanted to know if like where we should be looking for that in the budget, if that was part of the SEL line, or if there's a sort of separate, um, yeah, I guess if you could kind of clarify, uh, you know, how we how we would understand the expenditure, and I think kind of echoing Rebecca's last comment that that that's really what we're looking for is where where that's going to be first. Yeah. So we, we, what I'd, I'd like to do is is for the next meeting, I'll come back with. Uh, sort of a, a crosswalk of some of our grant funds and how we use that to support professional development. Uh, I'll also uh, look at our sort of overall PD plan. Uh, so there's some of it's built into our schedule, right? So we have uh, seven half days and four whole days connected to professional development and some of it happens there and that's just built into uh, our time. Uh, the principals and staff also have uh, something on the order of 20 faculty meetings a year, uh, and some work happens there. Uh, there's also um, um, uh, several stipended roles, particularly uh, instructional leads and, and social emotional leads, uh, and, and there's, work, there's work happening there. So let, let me come back uh, with, with a slide or two, maybe three or four, uh, detailing uh, some, of, some of that work. Okay, last chance. Can you get on? If not, you guys are open for the public hearing. Okay, we are adjourned. Okay, thank you. Thank you.